So I'm, I'm really back. I get to preach today and everything. None of this sitting on the sidelines business. <laughs> Well, yeah, Jim, Phil has talked to us, too. We can pray for him as he talks with us. After the <laughs> um, and a couple of, a bunch of you actually have been asking where my little sidekick is. For those of you who don't know me well, I have a little three-month-old. Um, and she is in the middle of this very adamant bottle strike. She has so many opinions. This little girl, I think she's five months, not three months. But <laughs> she just will not eat from a bottle. So rather than having her screaming and crying because she's hungry and I can't feed her right now here, Jeremy, her dad, is at home with her doing that at home. So hopefully right now she's eating from a bottle, but she's probably just really mad. <laughs> so we can all say a little prayer for him, too, this morning. Um, Anyway, if you have a Bible with you or next to you or can find one, um, turn with me to 2 Peter 3, verses 1 through 9. It's towards the end, towards the back of your Bible. It says this. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I've written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets, and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Above all, you must understand that scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, in quotation marks, that Jesus promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as we understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for these words from Second Peter, and we ask that you teach us from them more about who you are and who we are as your people here this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. So this passage took me through quite a journey this week. I was first drawn to it thinking, okay, we just came through Advent and Christmas where, you know, Advent, we're not only waiting for Christmas to come, but also for the second coming that the author of Second Peter talks about in this passage. So that's where I thought that I was headed. And then it felt kind of doomy and gloomy, which I'm not really a doom and gloom kind of person, so I wasn't sure what to say. But I, I wanted to focus on the hope of Christ coming again, right? This hope that we think about in Advent. And the author here is writing to a church that's been having kind of a hard time. You know, it talks about scoffers and people mocking them and saying, well, if Jesus is coming, then where is he? It's been years. What's going on? Imagine what they say to us now. We're still waiting some thousands of years later. And if you look at previous, previous passages in Second Peter, you see there's talk about false teachers who are kind of trying to undermine the truth of the gospel. And it's talking about um, there's kind of a defense of the gospel, as if people had forgotten what was true and what was false. This church was having a hard time, and that's why they were given this letter. So that's where I, that's where I thought that I was headed, but then verse 8 and 9 kind of stopped me in my tracks the more I read it. We'll look at it again. Verses 8 and 9. There we go. Stay open, Bible. Verse 8 and 9 says, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in, respond, in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but have everyone come to repentance. So then I started thinking, okay, so Christ hasn't come yet because not everyone believes. So this passage is about, right, all those people out there who don't know Christ, who don't believe, and they need to get their act together because they're keeping us waiting, right? <laughs> so I thought, okay, then maybe we'll go kind of an evangelistic direction this morning. So our job is to, to preach the gospel because how can they believe if they don't know? But I looked at it again. And that's not even what this passage was saying. 
It's not like, and I was thinking about my kindergarten teacher. I remember when um, I was in kindergarten, if we would kind of act up in kindergarten, my teacher did a, good, did a good job of kind of closing the book or putting down the marker or whatever we were doing and saying, okay, we'll just wait. And when you're ready, then we'll all keep going. And so we'd all kind of look at the naughty kids. Never me, of course. No. <laughs> <laughs> we'd all kind of watch them, and they'd get embarrassed, and eventually they stopped doing whatever it was they were doing, and we could all move on. So I thought, is that what this is saying? You know, we're waiting for all those naughty unbelievers to kind of see the light and join us, and we can all move on together. But if you really look at verses 8 and 9, Look at it again. It says, no, Christ is being patient with you, the church. Christ is being patient with the believers, not those naughty unbelievers out there. With us, with me. We are the ones keeping Christ waiting. Patiently, sure, but still waiting. And that changes everything, doesn't it? That kind of blew my mind this week. That it's not, you know, it's not just about hope in this passage that's in there too and it's not just about evangelism but what are we missing what are we doing or not doing that's keeping Christ waiting I thought how fitting for this, this season after Advent right in Advent we talk a lot about us waiting but now here is God waiting on us not just the other way around so I've been trying to kind of figure this out all week. What are we doing or not doing? Or what should we be doing that's keeping Christ waiting on us, the believers, the church? So I was reading books and articles and commentaries, trying to figure this out and think about what in the world I was going to say now, because it totally was switched from where I thought I was going. And I finally came across an article by a church planter and an author named Josh Burnett. And he used a metaphor that really resonated with me. And you might understand why when I say it. He talked about we need to do ministry pregnant. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, first day back from maternity leave, I spent most of 2014 quite literally doing ministry pregnant. Right? My daughter was born in September, so those first nine months, that's what I was doing. So I read this article and I was intrigued. That was the title of the article right there, Do Ministry Pregnant? And I thought, well, what does that mean? <laughs> so this, this guy, Josh Burnett, was looking at this passage and asking that same question, what are we doing or not doing that keeps God waiting? And his thought was, I don't know what the church in Second Peter was doing, but maybe our church, our churches today, aren't doing ministry pregnant. And by that, he, he simply meant, you know, doing, doing ministry pregnant is to follow God's call by looking at what he's going to do next. Following God's call by looking at what kind of new things God might be giving birth to through us as we go on in ministry with him. Doing ministry not just to benefit ourselves, but to benefit someone else, maybe even some little person we've never met before. Making our churches not just for us here in this room, but for others. That's what Josh Burnett was suggesting the church was getting wrong and making Christ wait. Instead of doing ministry with an eye to what God is doing next, maybe we spend too much time trying to maintain our status quo, to keep our people in our congregation, and to, to build our ministries and our programs and our congregation. Maybe we spend too much time focusing on what's already here and not enough on what's coming next. Maybe we don't spend enough time taking God at his word that he's doing a new thing and seeking to follow and run after that new thing that God is up to. Doing ministry pregnant. Doing ministry in a way that gives birth to a new generation of Christ followers. So, I don't think I need to go into the birds and the bees this morning. If there are kids that can hear me, you can talk to your parents when you get home. But, <laughs> but I think it's fair to say we all know, right? Assuming everything goes well, pregnancy generally leads to a baby, right? That's, that's science. That's good. That's what's supposed to happen. Some of you in this room have been pregnant before. Maybe you remember, but when, when you're pregnant, everything changes. Everything about you changes. I remember when I was pregnant and I was telling people, the response often was, oh, just wait, in nine months, everything is going to change. 
And I thought, no, everything's changing right now. <laughs> you know, everything changes the second you find out you're pregnant. I remember when I learned I was pregnant, um, I didn't know that I was pregnant at the time of the Super Bowl last year, but it turned out that I was. And I, I was at Dale's Super Bowl party, and I had had a beer and a glass of champagne, and I cannot tell you how guilty I felt <laughs> over those two little drinks that I had at the Super Bowl party. All of a sudden, my perspective on what was a really fun night changed into this guilt-inducing thing. What did I do to my poor baby by having one whole beer and a glass of champagne? pain. And everything, everything changed for me in that moment. From the way that I ate, I had to give up things like stinky cheese and medium rare steaks and certain kinds of sausages, which may not seem like a big deal to you, but for this Wisconsin born and bred girl, that's like my, that's all I eat. That's my food. <laughs> that was hard to do. Before I was pregnant, I was up to maybe two cups of coffee and a couple of Diet Cokes to get me through the day, and I had to cut back on caffeine. Even the way that I fed my body had to change because I was pregnant. My perspective on everything changed. I learned even my dental health could affect the development of my baby, so I started flossing for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> I made a dentist appointment for the first time since I lived in Seattle. Sorry, Mom, it's true. But I <laughs> this whole, my whole world shifted when I learned that I was going to meet this new little person in nine months. Every, everything changed when I was pregnant. My whole, my whole world just shifted. Suddenly it wasn't just about me anymore. It wasn't about what I liked to eat or wanted to do or wanted to drink or if I liked flossing or if it hurt my gums or not. It was about the health of my baby. Everything was about the health of my baby. It changed right away. Not just your body changes, to your thinking, your emotions change. I even read an article, Richard's daughter posted this article on Facebook um, earlier this week about the neurological differences in a pregnant woman's brain. The way that my neurons fire in my brain now, all of us who are mothers, in fact. <laughs> um, the way that our brain chemistry works is different because we were pregnant. There's biological deep changes that happen. Your world when you're pregnant is not just about yourself anymore. It's about you and your baby. And it makes your perspective not just about what's happening right now, but what's going to happen next. You're always looking ahead to what God has in store for you next. So what would happen if the focus of our church was like the focus of a pregnant woman? You know, what would happen if the focus of our church was to shift from us right here in this room to be about the health and well-being of someone else? What if we were to stop thinking about just our own needs and our own wants, not that those aren't important, but put someone else's needs and wants and development and growth ahead of our own? Scripture assures us over and over, and it shows us in stories and, and tales of God doing new things all the time, God is in the business of doing new things. So what if we started looking more to those new things and less to what's already happening right now in our church? What if we decided that 2015 was going to be the year that Harvard Church wasn't about Jana or Paul or Andrea or Dave? What if it was about the students at Whitman Middle School down the road or Viewlands Elementary or even our own little preschool in our basement downstairs? What if we decided that Harvard Church wasn't about us anymore, but it was about the, the people we met at Holy Ground's coffee shop down the street, or just living in the houses between Holman Road and 92nd? What would happen to each of us as individuals and to us as a church if our perspective shifted like that this year? Is Josh Burnett right? Is that what Christ is waiting for? Is that what our churches are missing? That we as believers are too focused on ourselves? And so Christ is waiting for us to stop looking inward and to start looking for someone else? I don't know. Maybe he's on to something. Maybe this year we are called to love and care for each other. Yes, of course. But we're also being called out in new ways. Maybe each of us are being called to give birth, so to speak, 
to some new expression of Christ's love in our neighborhood, in our families, in our relationships, what would happen? And you may or may not be surprised to hear this, but the changes that start in pregnancy don't just go away when pregnancy is done. I'm not pregnant right now anymore, but my whole world is even more changed than I ever was before with my little girl. Um, I'm, I'm still, my, my emotions are still different, and my empathy is different, and my perspective and my priorities have all shifted. My marriage is different. My, the way my house looks and feels is different. Even on Friday night, Jeremy and I had eight couples over, with all with babies about the same age as our little girl, Nora. Um, and we, you know, we were, had some pizza, we were having a good time, and we were talking about normal things at first, like the Seahawks and all that, and it was fine and kind of polite, but the party really got started when we started talking about the different ways that poop has escaped our baby's diapers. <laughs> <laughs> that's when we really started having fun. That's totally different than anything we would have done, you know, a year ago <laughs> with some friends at our house. Our whole world has changed, and it feels like so much of me is wrapped up in this little tiny package that we call Nora Miriam Co. So much of who I am is now about her, not just about me. So this time that I spent being pregnant has changed me forever. And by the way, even those neurological differences in the article that Richard's daughter posted, <laughs> those don't go back. My brain is forever different. And all of you mothers in the room, your brains are forever different because of what it went through in pregnancy. And even things like the way my body processes food and my hormones and all of those things are different because I have this new little person. So imagine what would happen to our church if we shifted our focus. If we let ourselves do ministry pregnant, we would be changed forever too, just like I've been with my daughter. Imagine what kind of changes God can make in us and in our lives together as Harbor Church if we were to seek this year to do ministry pregnant. To live and minister and pray and love and care for each other in such a way that it's not just about us, but it's about someone else. It's about others. It's about giving birth to some new expression of God's love in Crown Hill in Seattle, Washington, in 2015. What would happen? Maybe Josh Burnett is right. Maybe that's what our churches are getting wrong today. Maybe that's what's keeping Christ waiting on us. Maybe we're the naughty kids in kindergarten <laughs> that need to get our act together so we can all move on. I don't know. I don't have answers to these questions. I, I don't have a program proposal to give to you afterwards. I haven't been talking with our elders about some new mission and vision for Harbor Church. Um, maybe if I did those things, I'd be missing the point. But I can't help but believe that God is going to do something new with us this year. I can't help but hear this passage pleading to us to listen to God's call to follow him to new places, and to do ministry pregnant together. And imagine the transformation he could bring if we do. Let's pray. God, we thank you for, for this call and this encouragement. And we ask that you give us the, the courage and the boldness to go where you call us and to follow you into those new things that you're doing right here in our church and in our lives in this place. In your name we pray. Amen.